Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to give this lecture and also for making it technically possible. Uh, the title of my talk is Electron Plasmon and Electron Magnon Scattering in Elementary Ferromagnets from First Principles. And I put here this technical word GWT, self-energy. And this self-energy combines two methods that you have already learned about this week, namely the GW approximation for the self-energy. The GW approximation describes the scattering of electrons and plasmons. And the T matrix, and that is actually calculated uh, with the beta psi peta equation. You learned about the beta psi peta equation in the first talk today. And I would say in, in this case, this is a magnetic T matrix as it describes uh, the magnons. And the magnon is um, the energy quanta uh, of many body spin excitations in an interacting system. And if we combine then the T matrix with the green function, we can calculate the scattering of electrons and magnons. And this is uh, presumably important for magnetic materials. And there is also experimental evidence for that. I show you some photo emission spectra here. First of all, one sees a strong spin asymmetry in the lifetime broadening of uh, bands. You know that if you do a photo emission experiment, uh, you do not only see the bands, you also see a broadening of the bands. And this is not just a finite resolution of the experiment, this is physics. This is called the lifetime broadening of the bands and can in principle also be calculated from GW. I will come back to that later on. Now, um, if we uh, do a photo emission experiment for iron, for example, uh, we see that there is a strong spin asymmetry in the lifetime broadening in the sense that the majority bands, let's say the spin up bands, uh, broaden a lot to the extent that at some point it, they cannot be seen anymore because of this very strong lifetime broadening. Whereas uh, the spin down bands, the minority bands, uh, remain well defined to much larger binding energies. So this could be due to scattering with magnons. Um, there is another observation. I'll just uh, switch off my little window here. Uh, there is another observation, namely um, band anomalies have been observed in magnetic materials. For example, in this spin down surface band of iron already about 20 years ago. So they found uh, a kind of a king structure here. So you see the band does not have this pure parabolic dispersion. They have this uh, king structure. And since this king appears at an energy that is a typical magnon energy, so 100, 200 milliEV, people have thought that this probably comes from the scattering of electrons and magnons because it looks similar to the kink you see in electron uh, phonon scattering. But this is just a conjecture. This hasn't been proven yet. Now, about five years ago, uh, there was another uh, photo emission experiment by colleagues in Jülich, and they found this zigzag line here in a spin down band of bulk iron. Now bulk is for us easier to handle or easier to calculate than uh, surface um, states. And uh, this zigzag line here appears at a binding energy, which is much larger. It's about one to 1.5 EV. So it might be questionable whether this can come from electron magnon scattering, but we'll see. Would like to come back to this first observation. Um, I already alluded to the fact that in GW uh, we do not only get the bands, we also get the lifetime broadening. And the question would be perhaps GW alone can already dis uh, explain this strong um, difference in the lifetime broadening between majority and minority spins. 
and uh, GW self energy is spin dependent after all. But if we calculate, sorry, yeah, if we calculate uh, the GW band structure and actually calculate the full spectral function, so we would also get the lifetime broadening, uh, we see that there is not much difference in the lifetime broadening between spin up iron and spin down iron. So if you look at a band, for example, this one here and this one here at about the same binding energy, there is not much difference. So certainly not so much difference as we see in experiment. Um, okay, before I start, I want to give you a short overview of the talk. Uh, the talk will be split in two parts. In the first part, we talk about the way how we can calculate many body spin excitations. We do that uh, by calculating the magnetic response function, which is related to the T matrix, uses the same diagrams. And uh, this is calculated mathematically in terms of a beta psi beta equation, similar to the one that you've seen uh, this morning. But we solve it a bit differently. We don't use a electron hole Hamiltonian, but rather um, a formulation in Vanier functions. Uh, I will show you a few examples and also talk a little bit about a problem here that is uh, the Goldstone violation. And then in the second part of the talk, we'll, um, I will introduce the construction of the self-energy, namely the GWT self-energy. And this is motivated by iterating Hedin's equations. I'm sure you, you learned about Hedin's equations um, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday. Uh, and then I'll show you results for iron, in particular comparison to dynamical mean field theory and to experiment. Uh, lifetime broadening, renormalization, span anomalies, also report on magnetic moments, D bandwidth, exchange splittings. And if time allows, I will perhaps briefly talk about another <laughs> violation, namely the violation of causality, which is might be interesting. And then uh, I finish with my conclusions. Okay, to start with, um, we want to calculate the many body spin excitations. And we want to do this from first principles. Um, the way to do it is to calculate the magnetic response function. The magnetic response function has peaks, or the imaginary part of it, I should say, has peaks at the position of the many body spin excitation energies. The magnetic response function gives the change or the linear response, let's say, of the magnetization density with respect to the changes in the external B field. And this already uh, gives you a three by three matrix of response functions. Yeah, it's not just one response function, it's actually a matrix of response functions. A three by three because the magnetization density is of course a vectorial quantity because spin is a vector. So you have sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. This is the spin density. And the B field is also a vectorial quantity. We have Bx, By, Bz. Now, if you do the derivation uh, in, in theory, uh, you realize that you also couple to the total density response function, which gives the change of the total density with respect to changes in the external potential, and also all cross terms. Now, this looks like um, a big challenge to calculate all these response functions, but luckily we can simplify a lot. Namely, in the first uh, step, if we neglect spin orbit coupling, because then the full matrix falls into a block diagonal form. So we have then here uh, the block with the density response function and also the longitudinal spin susceptibility and the cross terms. Uh, and we have the transversal susceptibility here. And this is actually the one that we are interested in because this gives us the low energy spin excitations, which are more um, important for scattering with electrons. 
still it's a two by two matrix, but this can further be simplified by a coordinate transformation from Cartesian coordinates Bx and Bx into circular, circularly polarized coordinates B plus and B minus. So this corresponds to one sense of rotation, circular uh, rotation. This uh, uh, corresponds to another sense of rotation. Um, and if we do this coordinate transformation, then this um, upper block becomes block di uh, becomes diagonal. And actually, these two response functions here uh, are related to each other in in the Fourier transformation. So if we go from omega here to minus omega, we can relate to, to the two response functions. And it's um, physically appealing, uh, namely. So if we um, um, apply a circularly polarized B field with a certain sense of rotation, the response of the system is in the same sense of rotation. So we have B plus and also sigma plus here. And uh, this then yields uh, our typical physical picture of a spin wave. Um, so if we uh, apply this uh, circularly polarized B field, this will force the a spin, which is pointing in positive z direction, let's say, to precess about the z direction. And since the spins interact with each other in terms of the exchange interaction, uh, a spin wave will um, propagate through the material in the form of a plane wave. And that's then the spin wave or a transversal spin wave can also write this mathematically as a spin-spin correlation functional, spin-spin uh, uh, correlation function, uh, similarly to the density-density correlation function, but I don't want to um, uh, focus on that. I would rather uh, describe how we calculate the magnetic response function. Just to remind you, we want to calculate the change in the spin magnetization or spin density with respect to changes in the external B field. Now we can write the spin density in terms of the single particle interacting green function. Uh, and the prefactors here are just the Pauli spin matrix elements. And since we have formulated this in terms of the green function, we can now use all, all the tools of many-body perturbation theory that, that you've also heard about uh, during this week. So instead of calculating then this functional derivative, we just calculate very uh, generally the functional derivative of the green function with respect to an external B field. Now I just leave out all the uh, indices here to simplify the notation. Uh, as a first step, we introduce the Dyson equation, which can be written in matrix form in this way. Then we use the chain rule of functional derivatives. We obtain this expression, uh, which we then can carry out. And we obtain uh, two terms, of which the first one is just the bubble diagram. Uh, this bubble diagram uh, describes the so-called stoner excitations. These are single particle uh, excitations of electrons, which then undergo a spin flip. So for example, if an electron resides here and we excite it, it might go from, let's say, majority, bin, uh, ma majority uh, band to a minority band. So it would also undergo a spin flip in the process. This is, of course, a genuine uh, spin excitation. It's called a stoner excitation. The second term is perhaps more interesting because this term also describes the spin wave excitations that I have described before. And the typical uh, excitation energy can go down basically to zero EV or in the, for in the order of milli EV which is different from the stoner excitations, which are uh, typically in the order of a band energy, so one EV or half an EV or something like that, or rather in the order of, uh, I should say, the exchange splitting. 
I think Arya Setia, Ferdi Arya Setia Van, Christa Carlson formulated this um, in terms of the beta cell peta equation. Um, okay, and uh, also this uh, second term renormalizes the stoner excitations. It's also an important effect. But still, we cannot do any calculations because we have to find an approximation for the self-energy. And of course, we use the famous GW approximation, uh, which is given by the product of the green function and the screen interaction. We now calculate the functional derivative. You see, this is the functional derivative here. We obtain two terms because we use the product rule. The first term is the screen interaction. And the second term is something more complicated. But luckily, the second term can be neglected if we neglect, oh, no, it's not, not can be neglected, uh, is zero if we neglect spin orbit coupling. So we can just stick to this first term. And that's also the term that is usually used in uh, the beta cell peta equation for optical absorption. Now it doesn't continue. Ah, here we are. Uh, now plugging this first term in the equation that you saw on the previous slide, we end up with uh, this equation here, again written in a very simple form, and that's the beta cell peta equation. It has the magnetic response function that I call R. It has the actually the magnetic response function of the non-interacting system called K. That's the screen interaction and then the magnetic response function again. And here again, written in terms of Feynman diagrams. Now, usually in optical absorption, what would then uh, proceed uh, introducing a product basis uh, in terms of, for example, the cone sham states, and then diagonalize uh, the Hamiltonian, an electron hole Hamiltonian. We do that differently. We introduce Vanier functions because then we can solve this equation as a matrix equation. So we just, if we want to calculate the R here, we just have to invert a matrix. Um, and uh, with the basis of Vani functions, we uh, resolve all these vertices. Here this vertex, here with this vertex, this one, this one, this one, this one. So in the end, the magnetic response function becomes a, a function of four points in space, and in principle also four points in time, which can be simplified, for, first of all, by saying that the Hamiltonian doesn't depend uh, explicitly on time, and the second simplification is that we use the static approximation for the screened interaction. And this is also what is done in optical absorption. We do yet another approximation, and that's very important to make the calculations uh, efficient, namely we assume whenever the electron and the hole interact with each other, they are in the same atomic site. That's what we call an on-site approximation. And this is something that I have to justify now. I uh, would like to say that uh, we, we published this together with Erzoy Jajoglu about 14 years ago, the first application of that. Uh, so I have to justify this on-site approximation. I justify this uh, for the materials that we're interested in, iron, cobalt, nickel, the fundamental ferromagnets. And we see here that the on-site um, screen interaction is quite large. That's the on-site parameter, let's say, on-site matrix elements. So the average matrix elements we, we show here. And that's the nearest neighbor interaction, the next nearest neighbor, and so on. And you see it falls off rapidly, really. It, it falls off by 98%. So just keeping the on-site matrix elements should be sufficient for our purpose. Yeah, okay, what, what do we do then? Uh, we, we calculate uh, the non-interacting response function K, uh, from our Kohn-Sham system, we do a DFT calculation where the Kohn-Sham system calculate the magnetic non-interacting magnetic response function K. We calculate the RPA screen interaction, and then we can solve for the R. 
And it's then a four point response function. Then in order to get a physical response function, we contract the two sides here. We get then a two, part, a two point response function and we project the two point response function onto a plane wave. And then we it's take, awesome. yeah. It's yeah. Awesome. Um, I have a, a, a just a question on the on the equation. Um, so, does the on-site approximation on W reduces uh, the four point of the full beta salpeter or not? Or it still is a four point. Uh, it's still a four point. It's still a four point because uh, you can have four points. Um, how, how would I say? So first of all, I, I should make one remark first. I said whenever they interact with each other, uh, they should be on the same side. But of course, the K can ev go every which way. Yeah, so uh, in the propagation, they can also leave each other more than one side, two sides, no problem. But when they interact with each other, they are on the same side. Uh, but if I say on the same side, it doesn't mean on the same point. So we still have a four point function. In space, okay. And we have a still a four point function in space. Yeah. It's and, just, that, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and from the technical point of view, so you have uh, this, uh, let's say, symbolic inversion to do to find the R uh, in four point in space. So how do you do that? Is it sort of four dimensional matrix? How or, or you group by two by two the? Oh, this is very similar to the normal beta salpeter approach. We also have a product basis, but we ah, don't okay. have a product basis of the corn sham states. We have a product basis of the Vanier states. Ah, okay, then it's a product basis. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, we take the imaginary part of that response function and project it on to a plane wave uh, with wave vector Q. And we do that for all kinds of Qs, for very many along this uh, k-point path from P over gamma to N. This is for iron, BCC iron. And then we get this, uh, okay, uh, for each, sorry, uh, to explain a bit more, for each Q, let's say here, we calculate this function, we plot it vertically, and then we splice together very, very many of these cues here, and we got this um, dispersion of the magnum. And this is what you would expect from theory. We know that the magnum dispersion or the acoustic magnum dispersion should be parabolic. Uh, but we also see a lot of uh, lifetime broadening through interaction of the spin wave with the stoner excitation. This is what you see here. So this uh, grayish background, this is the stoner continuum. And this branch here, this, these are the spin wave excitations. We can also compare with experiment. So this looks quite nice. Um, this is from a neutron uh, spectroscopy. But you also see something interesting, namely, uh, there are some parts where we see very strong interaction between the stoner continuum and the spin wave branch. And in the case of nickel, this is a particularly uh, strong interaction here. And you see here a zoomed in image. So the uh, magnon branch here turns into the stoner, let's say stoner, what I call it, stoner band, perhaps stoner band. And the stoner band turns into a magnon branch here. So you have something like an avoided crossing, but not of single particle bands, but of many body states. Um, okay, what you see here is already, let's say, a corrected spectrum. And if you just calculate starting from LSDA and you, you go through the uh, procedure, you calculate the R, you plot it, you get a different picture. And now I just show you basically a fitted the fitted points here. We would expect a parabolic dispersion. It is a parabolic dispersion here, but we see a gap error. Normally, you would expect the spin wave branch to start at zero, but here it starts at a finite energy. 
first of all, why should we start at zero at all? And this is uh, due to the uh, Goldstone uh, condition, or how do you say the Goldstone theorem. And physically, it can be uh, explained in a very simple way. Suppose you have all your spins pointing, let's say, in positive z direction, and we don't have spin orbit coupling. Then it doesn't take any energy to rotate all spins collectively. So even an infinitesimal B field that points in this direction, perpendicular to the, to the spins, can rotate the spins uh, collectively by uh, a macroscopic amount, let's say. And this is relates to having the spin wave branch starting at zero energy. It doesn't take any energy, so it starts at zero energy. But in the calculation, the raw calculation, this doesn't work. And the reason why this doesn't work is because we start with the LSDA green function. The LSDA... Uh, so if you go back to the beta salpeter equation, we use the GW approximation there. So in principle, from a theoretical point of view, we should not use the LSDA green function. We should use uh, the fully self-consistently calculated green function, GW green function. But that is a bit too um, uh, expensive. And therefore, we use here the Corsex green function. That is an equally good choice that should also not have that problem. And in fact, if we use the Corsex green function, that's a kind of a static approximation to GW. The Corsex green function then gives us this parabolic dispersion, but the gap arrow is nearly disappears. Well, there is still a little bit remaining gap arrow due to, um, yeah, uh, insufficient conversions or so. Um, but of course, using Corsex for all these calculations is a bit uh, too difficult. And therefore, we just wanted to use LSDA because ultimately, uh, the, this quadratic dispersion doesn't look so different from the Corsex dispersion. So we just wanted to use LSDA and correct it in some way. And the way we correct it, I want to motivate now this is now a little bit mathematical. You, you will not get all the details. Doesn't matter. I just want to convince you that there is a there is an idea behind it. So I'd start here again with the beta salpeter equation, which can be written in this way. That's already uh, involving the matrix inversion here. R is the magnetic interacting magnetic response function. K is the non-interacting magnetic response function. W is the screen direction and well, we know this is the change of the magnetization density with respect to changes in the external B field. Now we say, say uh, uh, solve this equation for delta B. So we take delta B on one side and this to the other side, we have to take the inverse of that matrix on the left-hand side, which gives us this line. And here I put delta B to zero. And that is simply because of the remark I made before about the Goldstone theorem. So even infinitesimal B field can give rise to a macro macroscopic change in delta M. So we can take the delta B to zero and have something finite here. Then from the intercept theorem, we see that delta M should be proportional to the magnetization density itself. So we can replace delta M by M. And then by rewriting that, we get this eigenvalue equation. That is our Goldstone condition for the interacting system. The non-interacting K times the screen direction W, that's a matrix, should have an eigenvector, which is the magnetization density, with eigenvalue 1. Now we have to uh, can make the connection to LSDA, to density functional theory. So we formulate the same thing for the corn sham system. Then instead of the interacting uh, magnetic response function, we have the non-interacting magnetic response function, which gives the change of the magnetization density with respect to changes in the external exchange correlation B field. That's the B field, that part of the exchange correlation potential that uh, creates the magnetization in the Cohen-Sham system. Now we solve for the change of the 
change correlation B field in the same way we did here, but this cannot be taken to zero because in the cone sham system, we really have a B field that forces uh, the spins in a certain direction. And now we only have to make, okay, uh, here we can use the intercept theorem now also for the BXC. This gives us such a relation. We plug that in. We then have this relation here. And now we take we we uh, um, insert the Goldstone condition here, and we obtain BXC equals WM. And the long wavelength component of the exchange correlation B field is just the exchange splitting, delta X. And this delta X is related then to the W and to the magnetization density. So we have to make sure that our LSDA system fulfills that equation. Um, and okay, how can we ma uh, make, uh, make this sure? Uh, we cannot change the W. That is just calculated from RPA. We cannot change the magnetization density because this comes out of the DFT calculation. But we, what we can do is we can change the chain splitting because that is just shifting spin up and spin down states with respect to each other uh, until the Goldstone condition is fulfilled. Of course, this is a very pragmatic approach, but it's uh, just a motivated here. And that is what we do. We calculate LSDA, change the exchange splitting, and then continue. And we just have to compare this now to COSEX, and we see that these green points, the corrected LSDA, in fact, nearly lie on top of COSEX. So the corrected LSDA mimics COSEX in this, in this um, situation. Now I continue with constructing the GWT self-energy. And I want to do that by uh, iterating Hedin's equations. You know that if you iterate Hedin's equations, so there's uh, five different differential, um, integral differential equations, in principle, you would uh, end up with the exact solution, but numerically, we cannot afford to do such a calculation. It's too hard. But we would, what we can do is we can theoretically create higher and higher orders of uh, the self-energy diagram. So by iterating to Hedin's equation, we get in the first uh, cycle the famous GW self-energy. Um, and then... Uh, if you iterate further, you get these uh, second, the second order diagram, the third order diagrams here. Okay, this is here shown up to uh, third order in the screen interaction. And actually, these two diagrams are the first diagrams, the lowest order diagrams that can uh, couple two different green functions. Because if you look at these other diagrams, this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on, there is always a green function going all the way through the diagram. And as long as you don't have spin orbit coupling, uh, you cannot couple here spin up with spin down because this green function will always be in the same spin channel. But here, for example, here, we can have this electron in one spin channel and this hole here <laughs> in another spin channel. And the combination of the spin up, let's say spin up electron and spin down hole, is a part of the solution of the beta salpeta equation. It's a letter diagram. So this is what we would obtain from the beta salpeta solution. And here it is combined with the green function to make a self energy diagram out of it. Uh, this diagram is something that we have not implemented. It describes a different process because here we do not have an electron and a hole, but we have two electrons or two holes, the same, always the same particle. That's also uh, important. It gives rise to, for example, the 6 EV satellite in nickel. Um, but we have not implemented that because we wanted to focus on the magnetic excitations, in particular the magnon excitations and the scattering with the electrons. So we implemented uh, this diagram here and also all higher order diagrams. So the third order, the fourth order, the fifth order, up to infinite order. Interestingly, we start here with a third order. We don't start with 
the second order, for example, or the first order. And I will come to that in, in uh, two slides, I think. And so it's interesting that, that Hedin's iterating to he, three Hedin's equations actually tells us start from the third order, do not use the second order. And why this is so, we will see later on. We can uh, draw this particular uh, self energy in terms of the beta salpeta equation. See the third order and then all higher orders uh, written in terms of this so-called T matrix. Um, yeah, and this is what we call GT self energy. And then we simply combine it with, with GW by adding the two self energy simply. We are not the first who used this uh, approach. For example, already oh, many years ago, a group of uh, Ferdi Arya Setjavan with Krista Carlson and Martin Springer, Martin, I think was his first name. They calculate the six EV satellite in nickel that I mentioned before. Um, Chukov, Chukov, Echenike calculate lifetime effects in nickel and iron. Uh, then there is this theoretical work by Romaniello, Bechtet, and Reining, diachromatic expansion and considering different uh, uh, scattering channels, T matrix and GW and so on. And then there is also about two years ago, I think there is also now a second paper uh, by, by Pina. Uh, she considered the particle-particle channel in molecules in finite systems. Okay, we would like to interpret now this diagram a little bit to get a little bit of a physical understanding. So you might have heard in uh, the talk yesterday about, about GW, the inter physical interpretation of this diagram. Namely, we have an incoming electron here, which emits a plasmon. This is a plasmon propagator, and it absorbs the plasmon later on, continues this propagation, and that's how the energy of the, uh, of the electron is normalized. In the GT self energy part, we can interpret this in, in a similar way. We have an incoming electron which emits a, a magnon and later reabsorbs the magnon and continues its propagation. And uh, we can see this also in the spin direction. So if we have a spin up electron before, after emission of a magnon which carries away a unit spin, we have spin down. So electron has split, flipped from spin up to spin down due to spin conservation. And later when it reabsorbs the magnet of unit spin, it the, the spin of the electron flips back. So that's quite intuitive to understand. Uh, you might see that GT is a bit more complex diagram because here we have only two inner integration variables at three and four. And here we have four inner integration variables at three, four, five, and six. But the magnon propagator is a four-point function, and we keep it as a four-point function uh, in our um, uh, calculation. I would like to stay with this interpretation for, for a moment. So the way I have explained it now also uses a time uh, arrow. So we have first the emission, and later, at a later time, we have the absorption of the magnon. But I have mentioned before that this is an inner integration variable, and in principle, these two times could also be before these times. Then the diagram looks different, but topologically, it's the same diagram. It would look like this. So, and then, how do we interpret, interpret this? We have an incoming electron, which emits a magnon, and then the magnon carry, uh, uh, travels back in time, and also the electron rushes back in time like crazy, and then absorbs the magnon here, and then continues its propagation. That's an absurd interpretation. Never anything goes backwards in time. Now we just have to change the interpretation. And perhaps I wanted to say the remark that in principle, you could say perhaps that's an unphysical diagram. No, no, it's not an unphysical diagram. And it's also not zero if we calculate it. So that's included in our, uh, in our formalism. And it also has a reasonable physical interpretation, namely the following. So we stay with this time arrow here. 
we have an electron, spin up electron, which travels here. And then independently of that electron, at another point in space, we have a spin fluctuation. So we have the formation of uh, an electron hole pair here and an electron hole pair here, which is mediated by an interaction line. And these kind of spin fluctuations happen all the time in the ground state because it's an interacting ground state. Um, in in a, um, a non-magnetic systems, you also have these um, fluctuations, uh, density fluctuations. Um, and also in a vacuum, for example, in quantum electrodynamics, in a vacuum, you can have the spontaneous formation of uh, an electron-positron pair. So that's the analog of the vacuum fluctuations that you probably know. Okay, and then uh, while the, the hole here and the electron here form a magnon, which now carries forwards in time. And then this hole eliminates the electron and this electron here is left over and continues the propagation. You could also understand this as an exchange diagram where this electron stands in for that electron. Okay. Now I come back to uh, these diagrams and explain a little bit why don't we have the second order diagram here. Um, it looks actually reasonable. First of all, you could say, wait, if we add the Green, uh, if we add the GW diagram, we might have a double counting. Yeah, this is sort of correct uh, because we have here a bubble and that's an interaction line. That's an interaction line. So interaction, bubble, interaction is part of the W and that is then part of the GW approximation. But that's not quite correct because uh, this screen interaction here is the screen interaction. It's not the bare interaction. It would be that the argument would be correct. The argument would be correct if this were the bare interaction, but that's the screen interaction. So we have to take that into account. And then we realize that this diagram itself contains double counting errors and is unphysical and should not be included in the diagrammatic series. Because if we take the first order diagram of that first order in the bubble, then we have the bare interaction here, the bubble and the bare interaction. We take the zeroth order here, just the bare interaction. And in this diagram, we just take the other way around. These two diagrams are physical diagrams. They are contained in GW but um, they would be counted twice because they're actually the same diagram. We have a bubble here and a bubble here. And here we have a bubble here and bubble here, two, two, two bubbles, and it would be a, uh, a double counting. We don't want that. So that would be unphysical double counting. And that is actually nice about the Hedin's equations that it only gives us the physical diagrams, and it does not give us the non-physical, the unphysical diagrams, that if we draw the diagrams naively, we might have come up with such a diagram, which shouldn't be used. Okay, then a few uh, remarks about the implementation. We have to calculate the Dyson equation or calculate the fully uh, renormalized Greed function through the Dyson equation. Uh, usually, this is written in terms of, of a quasi-particle equation. Then you very often also linearize the self-energy. We, we don't do that here because we need to get all the, the lifetime effects. So we uh, calculate the full renormalized green function, and then we take the imaginary part of the green function, take the trace over the imaginary part of the green, of the green function, and that gives us the spectral function. Yeah. So in addition to the bands, we also get all the lifetime effects. And then we can plug in here for uh, the renormalized green function, the solution of the Dyson equation, and it is in this form then. 
And then perhaps a few remarks. I'm running a bit late, but uh, yeah, hurry up here a little bit. First of all, one very often in GW calculations, one very often restrict oneself to the diagonal elements of the self-energy only. One does not calculate the full self-energy matrix. But in this case, this would lead to a wrong uh, a band dispersion. You see this in blue here. So perhaps to go through all the lines, uh, the, the red is uh, LSDA. The, the blue is GW retaining only the diagonal elements of the self-energy. And you see this very unphysical dispersion here. This is certainly nothing reasonable. Uh, but if you take the full self-energy matrix, we get the green lines, and then uh, we get a reasonable band dispersion here. So for iron in particular, it was important to keep the full self-energy matrix. And then perhaps the other point, I've already uh, talked about uh, the violation of the Goldstone condition. We correct it by this uh, correction of the LSDA exchange splitting. And in the case of iron, this gives rise to a correction by 0.23 EV. And we make another uh, little correction here. And this is uh, due to the following problem. In the, the calculation of um, uh, self-energy corrections of metals. So if you do a self-energy correction in metal, you might you also have to recalculate the Fermi energy. But very often, if you just do a GW calculation, the Fermi energy is then uh, not anymore in the same position in, as the DFT Fermi energy. Uh, and then you, you might... For example, uh, have uh, features in the spectral function like band anomalies that appear on the wrong side of the Fermi energy. And another problem is if you look at the spectral function, it should become zero at the exactly at the Fermi energy. But if we correct the Fermi energy, it's not zero anymore there. Uh, and the spectral function would be quanti qualitatively incorrect. And therefore, we introduce here a little parameter, which simply adjusts the exchange uh, correlation potential of DFT in such a way that um, the Fermi energy does not change from DFT to GWT. And this is a correction uh, that was already uh, suggested by Lars Hedin in his seminal, I think it was already in the 1965 paper. Or it was in the in the review from the late sixties. Oh, it was already the nineteen sixty five paper. Yeah, yeah, okay. And in this case, it's uh, nearly one EV is a quite large correction. But I would like to say that this is really adding a single number on the exchange correlation potential everywhere in space. So if you did a Kornsham calculation, you wouldn't even see this change because it would just realign all energies. But in many body perturbation theory, it has an effect. Um, but another remark I want to, to make here is that uh, this parameter and also this parameter here are fixed by exact physical constraints. So we just don't, we cannot play around with them. We we determine them uh, also from first principles. Then, if you calculate a spectral function here for a simple material, silicon. Um, you do not only get the quasi-particle bands together with uh, the band broadening, you also get some additional features you, that you would not see in DFT calculations. So in DFT, everything would be black here. But if you do GW, you get something here. And this is what's called plasmon satellites and can be understood uh, by the fundamental photo emission process. So when the photon comes in and kicks out an electron from here, for example, the photon energy might not go fully into the electron, in, into the kinetic energy of the electron. Part of the photon energy might be um, uh, wasted in a many-body excitation, for example, a plasmon excitation. 
And then the electron that leaves the material seems to have has a lower kinetic energy and therefore seems to have come from a lower or higher binding energy or from a lower from a lower total energy. Uh, and therefore you get such uh, uh, features here, such plasmon satellites. They can also be seen in photo emission spectra. Now, in the electron magnon scattering, we do not deal with the large energy of a plasmon. So only because this energy is so large, we have a nice separation of the quasiparticle bands and these plasmon satellites. The difference is more or less 20 EV or something like that. In the magnon excitations have a much lower excitation energy, 100, 200, 300 EV. So you can imagine the uh, renormalized band structure to have a much richer structure. And this is in fact the case. So here I show you the first GWT calculation. This is the spectral function for iron, spin up and spin down. And you immediately see that the spin up uh, bands are much more strongly, much, yeah, much more strongly broadened than the spin down bands. And this is already a qualitative explanation for this very big difference in the lifetime broadening that we've seen in experiment. And this lifetime broadening is so strong that in fact that the bands here just disappear. So we have a band in DFT, but this band just disappears in the GWT calculation. We just get a very broad feature here, and that is simply due to lifetime broadening. It can be, this uh, uh, effect can be understood uh, in the following way. Um, in a situation where we have a spin up hole, yeah, or create an up hole, spin up hole, um, this hole has a lot of phase space to form a magnon together with an electron, spin, up, spin down electron here. That is simply due to the asymmetry of the density of states of a ferromagnet. Whereas if we create an, an ele an, a hole here, a spin down hole here, we have much less phase space. And that's why uh, the broadening of the, of the quasiparticle bands is much smaller here than in the spin up channel. We also get quite nice agreement with uh, dynamical meal field theory. So if you just compare uh, this spectral function from DMFT with a spectral function of GWT, um, it looks actually quite similar. And you also get here the very strong uh, lifetime broadening. And also in the spin down channel, we get very nice agreement, but we also see differences. And this is, of course, where, uh, where things get more interesting. For example, here, this band is not seen in GWT. It is seen in DFT. It is seen in DMFT. But it's not seen in GWT. The band just remains below the Fermi energy, never crosses the Fermi energy. And the same can be said about this band here. It just stays below the Fermi, en Fermi energy. Uh, yeah, we see another difference. We have a clear quasi-particle band here, but we have nothing in DMFT. And another difference, we have a band anomaly here. There is no such, sorry, there is no such band anomaly here. Now I'll go through all these differences and compare with experiment. If you uh, insert here all the photo emission data points, we see that there is actually no photo emission data point that would suggest that there should be a band crossing the Fermi energy. And also here, there is no point here, although we have this, this point here and we have that point here. So it seems that in, ex in experiment, in fact, the band should stay below the Fermi energy. And we can also compare with this uh, Fermi surface map experimentally uh, um, uh, determined, uh, then we do not see any pocket that would suggest uh, that a band crosses here. The lines that you see here are from DFT. 
but in the experiment there is in fact nothing. You may ask a question. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, 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 an orbital characterization of all these bands, at least at the level of uh, DFT? So, for example, if this uh, band in DFT and in dynamical MIFI theory crossing uh, the Fermi surface is as an SP or a D band? Uh, yeah, I, I probably we, we made an uh, orbital um, characterization of it, but actually forgot. I forgot what, what band that was. Uh, I suppose it should be a D state, but uh, I don't know if I look at it, because it is probably it, mixing say, a lot the S, it, it mixes a lot the S band. Yeah, I would say that something like a, this here. Uh, an S state because the D, I can imagine the D are the flat uh, localized states, so mostly, and this one is uh, it looks like an S state, so that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, GW, GW yeah. T is uh, is doing something that is is uh, deeply affecting even the uh, states. Yeah. I should say that this already is seen in GW. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually an effect of GW. Uh, if you take into account the off-diagonal elements, and if you take into account the off-diagonal elements, you also change the um, hybridization, I mean, the orbital character of the band. So it could be that this S band here turns actually into a D band because you have hybridization effects through the off-diagonal elements of the matrix. Yeah, so non-diagonal uh, uh, effects means that you are re-diagonalizing re the sulfanate, yeah. but yeah. You, you just only do an iteration, so you you're not yeah. self it's not self-consistent. No, I do one iteration. There is a there is an element of self-consistency through this um, parameter, this delta v that I've explained. Oh. Uh, we 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 enforce the Fermi energy not to change. So this gives a little bit of Boerman's approach to self-consistency. But apart from that, it's one shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the self-consistency allied in, as it is called. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and sorry, I have oh, it's already nearly one hour. I speed up a little bit. Um, we also wanted to know where this band anomaly comes from here, this one. Actually, this is now only GT, it's not GWT. And uh, if we take out all the higher order terms of the ladder diagram, only uh, um, use the third order, the leading order, then the band anomaly goes away. So we can safely say this comes from electron magnon scattering or spin wave scattering. And then there is another band anomaly, namely the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, this uh, zigzag line here. In GW, we don't see any band anomaly at all. So this is experiment, this is theory. But if we do a GWT calculation, we in fact see the band anomaly and it just appears at roughly the same uh, wave vector and roughly the same uh, binding energy. And it also has a very similar form. And in fact, in this particular case, the theory was before the experiment. So we, we showed this to our experimental colleagues and then they reinvestigated their data and they found the, the kink structure there. Um, now the question remains, why should that be at such a high binding energy? That's not a typical magnon energy. And that's simply because I would like to be very briefly on that. Uh, if we uh, zoom into the stoner excitations, we see at roughly the correct energy, we see uh, an increased intensity of stoner excitation. So what we see here is actually um, an interaction of the electron with stoner excitations. And they can be at much higher energy than magnons. And then very briefly, why do we get these strange uh, band anomalies at all? I uh, would like to explain this here. This is again our GT diagram uh, describing electron-magnon scattering. If we take a snapshot here, 
we can, so the electron here is uh, propagating through some single particle states. A single particle states graphically can be represented in terms of an electronic band. So let's say this is the electronic band. Now we take another snapshot. Now the, this snapshot, uh, this has a defined wave vector. It has a defined energy. It just involves more particles, at least three particles or perhaps many more particles. But we can also draw such a band. But, uh, well, and then uh, these two bands can create an unavoided crossing. And then we should remember the definition, the Lehmann representation of the green function. And you realize then that this part of the band, namely the snapshot here, should basically not be visible. In the Kohnsham system, this contribution would exactly be zero. But in an interacting system, it is not zero, but it is small and you should not see it. So we can just eliminate these parts of the bands. Then we only have these two branches. And here we get a lot of lifetime broadening. And then you already have uh, qualitatively this form that we've seen in the theory. And also in this uh, higher energy uh, king structure. Then very often, if you introduce a new method, um, you might improve one thing, but you worsen another thing. And therefore, we also wanted to calculate with GWT all these uh, magnetic quantities like the magnetic moments, spin magnetic moments, uh, D bandwidth, and exchange splitting. I don't want to go through all the table. I just want to give you the best agreement always with experiment. These are the green markers here. And you see GWT actually performs quite well compared with LSDA, GW, and GT alone. And here we have, let's say, a hole, but we can fill this hole by considering the second best agreement. Okay, and yeah, perhaps I should uh, finish now. I also have this violation of causality, but uh, I skip that. And I just want to acknowledge a few people, namely uh, Dima Nabok, who did all the calculations and all the interpretation of the GWT self uh, spectral functions. Matthias Müller implemented the T matrix, and I would like to um, acknowledge fruitful discussions with our colleagues from the experimental department. She's now in Krakow, and Stefan Blügel. Thank you very much. Okay. So, questions? Okay, we will start. So, Christopher, I'm very interested always in your uh, results on iron. And uh, I would like you to ask you, uh, so uh, again, back at the um, spectral function in iron, yeah, this one. So, uh, so you, you compared the, with the experiment and uh, with the FT. I would like to ask you more about the comparison with dynamic and field theory. Mm -hmm. If you know what are, what were the ingredients of the dynamic and field theory? Yeah, there was flex, a flex solver. Uh, so flex um, contains actually more diagrams than we contain. It has the GW, it has the T matrix. Uh, it also has the, the exchange T matrix, not the direct T matrix only. Um, but of course, everything restricted to a single atomic site. So there is the approximation in DMFT, and we have basically... Do, uh, we basically do the calculation in, in the full crystal. Uh, but the agreement between DMFT and GWT actually tells me that all these other diagrams that Flex has are not so important for this material in this energy range. It might be important for other energy ranges, um, but... I actually see a pretty good agreement here. 
Uh, but um, one also sees differences. And then, of course, we have to explain where does these differences come from, since DMFT actually has more diagrams. Um, and for example, this band anomaly here comes from uh, the interaction of electrons with spin waves. Now, spin waves are extended states yeah, uh, described by a plane wave taking into account very many atomic sites. But in DMFT, you try to describe uh, these spin waves in a single atomic site. Uh, and then you do not get um, a well-defined many-body excitation energy anymore. You get something much broader. And since it's much broader, you do not get such a band anomaly. So that's my interpretation. So simply trying to confine a spin wave in an atomic site really doesn't, cannot really work. And, and so you think the talks are clustered and I mean, if theory with only two sides, is not improving as well. Yeah, I think if they if we were able to do make the cluster big enough to capture that, then probably yes. So I would actually doubt that this is technically possible. But uh, yeah. I'm I'm not an EMFT expert. Okay. And about the other disagreement of binary gamma theory with, with the experiment uh, with respect to your GWT. So, for example, this missing uh, Fermi Fermi level crossing is it uh, due to the fact that this is this band? Uh, you know that in binary gamma theory you have to treat which band uh, to. To, to treat uh, in a dynamic amnifid theory way. So yep. each band uh, you consider it yeah. related yeah. and you put uh, an adjustable parameter on top and which other you keep at the DFT level? Yes, um, oh, it is an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really thought about it, but yes, it's true. Uh, I think they only used the D states here and left the S state, which actually uh, disperses through here on the DFT level could be, I'm not sure at the moment. So it could of course be that they did not take into account or did not take the S state into uh, DMFT and uh, then they cannot explain this um, yeah, hybridization and the suppression of the band below the Fermi energy. This might be the reason. Thank but you. it could also be the fact that our self-energy, the GW self-energy, is K-dependent, which in, in DMFT is not K-dependent. Yeah. And then in your self-energy, you have all the states. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We, we do not have to make, make a choice. Sure. We have all the states automatically. We don't have a double counting correction. Yeah, and we don't have a U and the and the J. But there are a few advantages. Actually, I forgot to say here, uh, that this uh, band uh, that we have in, in uh, GWT and we do not have in DMFT, actually in experiment, we do have some data points here as well. We don't have data points in, in between. Uh, that's due to the strong lifetime broadening, but we do have some data points here and this seems to indicate that this quasi-particle band should be there. But it trails off those band uh, bandwidth uh, gets larger and larger and larger, and I guess here this cannot be measured in an experiment anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. A technical one. Um, um, since the formalism is uh, very similar, at least on the schematic to the Bethesal Peter, so um, so typically, in uh, for in Bethesal Peter for optical absorption, we have to to converge with the number of bands. We have to mix a lot of uh, independent particle transition to get our exciton, and so we have a certain range of uh, bands in which we have to to converge. So now, how hard is to solve this problem for the specific case, for example, of the spin excitation? Do we still have so many? Uh, say independent particle states to mix or is different? Um, 
yeah, uh, so th this is a little bit of, pro of a problem here because um, technically we are limited to the bands that are used for the construction of the Vanier functions. Yeah, so those bands are what you uh, those those bands you would use in um, uh, optical absorption to build up the product bases. And in our case, we here used simply the S and S, P, and D states in R, nickel, and cobalt. So nine states altogether. Uh, and they make up the Vanier functions. And technically, those are the bands that are taken into account in the solution of the beta cell beta equation. Of course, we could go beyond that. We can construct more Vanier functions. Of course, the calculations would get then more and more, uh, heavier and heavier. Uh, it would be possible to somehow converge that. It's, that is not as straightforward because we have to also construct the Vanier function and so on. It's not as straightforward, I would say, as in optical absorption, where you simply can choose as a matter of choice which uh, bands you want to take into account in the solution of the beta cell beta equation. Okay, but then that means that then the matrix that has to be diagonalized or inverted, it depends only on how many one year function you take. So it's not enormous, right? No, it's That's not enormous. It's it's actually uh, yeah, quite small. Okay. It's it's uh, nine by nine. Yeah, eighty eighty one. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it is your last. Uh, Possibility, don't be shy. Okay, I have a question. Uh, so how does the computation time compare uh, between the T matrix and the GW? Oh. Um, yeah, I have, I have to remember that. Actually, it's not so different. Um, because it, when we do GW, we also calculate the full GW self-energy matrix. It also take a time it takes some time. We usually take into account very many states into GW to converge it. Uh, and then I would say as a comparison, the two self energies take take up uh, more or less equal time to calculate the GW and the GT. But GT, I think, would scale badly uh, or worse with respect to the number of atoms than GW. We're also safe by the fact that these are small systems. And the uh, the T matrix is not computed cell consistently. It's you only compute that when you have the GW self energy uh, self consistent. No, so uh, neither GW nor GT is calculated self consistently in the sense of really iterating through Hedin's equations. Is really a one shot calculation, and we try to start with the best starting point uh, possible in L this corrected LSDA green function. Uh, but it's not self consistent, but it includes infinitely many diagrams. So, in this sense, it is uh, self consistent, but, but not really cycling through the Hedin's equations. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you again. So Thank you. Thank you too. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.